Welcome to all of you in the room and those of you watching from home. We're going to start off with announcements this morning. Our first announcement is we'll have Kids Church February 5th, next Sunday, and February 19th. Next off, we, ha we will be having a DLT dinner, just kidding, a DLT mixer, February 26th, down in the Fellowship Hall. Um, we'll have more information for you guys once the date gets a little closer. Now that we've taken care of housekeeping, please stand for the reading of the word. Today we will be reading from Luke chapter 8, verses 11 to 15. The seed, just kidding, sorry guys. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. The seed along the path are those who have heard and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not be, believe and be saved. And the seed on the rock, those are the ones who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. Having no root, these believe for a while and fall away in a time of testing. As for the seed that fell among the thorns, these are the ones who, when they have heard, go on their way and are choked with worries, riches, and pleasures of life and produce no mature fruit. But the seed in the ground, these are the ones who, having heard the word with an honest and good heart, hold on to it and by enduring, produce fruit. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word and its promise that you will cause us to be good soil that yields a glorious harvest. Yes. Father God, teach us to read, understand, and follow your word. Guide us so that what is sown may not fall along the path on rocky soil or among thorns, but that it falls in the good ground. Help us, Lord, to recognize that you, that your word is the mirror in which we can check our spirits and allow our hearts to be good soil that takes root, grows, and flourishes. Heavenly Father, incline our hearts to your testimony. Open our eyes to see the wonderful things in all that you do. Unite our hearts to fear your name. Satisfy us with your steadfast love. Lastly, Lord, I ask that you direct each of our steps according to your will and your word. In the name of the great sower, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.
than these walls I'm circling You are stronger than this army that I see You are bigger than these mountains that I face And I will choose to only praise you You are greater than these walls I'm circling You are stronger than these armies that I see You are bigger than these mountains that I face And I will choose to only praise
we come before you. We give you glory and honor and praise as your spirit and holiness begin to rest upon us. Your glory is in this place today. We recognize it. I sense the heaviness of your presence, the sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I recognize that you are here. And you are asking us to cast our hesitation to the wind, Lord God. We've come through this season of fasting and prayer, and we thank you for it, Lord God. And we thank you for the things that you have revealed to us in it. We thank you, Lord God, that you have set us into a lifestyle that is going to move forward from this point forward. But Lord, we openly acknowledge, and I acknowledge as pastor of this body, that I still sense that there are areas of hesitation, fear. There are areas where, Lord, we still need to connect and commit. And so, Lord, we give our hesitation to you this morning. If you've got a hesitation in your spirit from the 21 days of fasting and prayer, something that you've sensed over the last 21 days that you just really need to give to God, I encourage you right now, even as we break this fast, I encourage you right now to commit that area the Lord's been speaking to you, to Him right now. Lord, all our hesitation we put aside right now, and we enter into that deeper place of commitment that you have already orchestrated that we should walk into. Lord, we know that you are calling us deeper. The things that my eyes have seen during these 21 days of fasting and prayer indicate that you are going to build a deeper commitment and connection with you and your Holy Spirit's power within this people in this room. And I thank you for that, Lord God, and I claim that for this congregation. I claim that deeper level of commitment, whatever it is in each of our individual lives. Right now, Holy Spirit, I pray that you produce it because we recognize in our own strength we cannot. Lord God, we are completely reliant upon you. And we need you to do it for us because we cannot do it ourselves. We need God to love you, God. We need you to move into our hearts and begin to produce that ability within us to do the deeper works of God that you have ordained that we should do. Further, Lord God, I know that this congregation is about to experience the supernatural move of the Holy Spirit in a way we have never experienced the supernatural move of the Holy Spirit before. I am claiming that and I call that forth, but I recognize it is your move, not ours. And so we come before you as a congregation, Holy Spirit. And we welcome you into this place and we say, whatever you have to do to make this space, our hearts, our congregation, a place where you are welcome and free to move, we give you permission right now to do that. Holy Spirit, we sing so easily, let me be undone. All I want is to be undone. Lord, let us understand and count the cost of being undone, Lord God, for you. All that means. Well, you know in this room, some of you know what that means. The well, Spirit's been talking to you about it during these last 21 days. This is what it's going to take. This is what it's going to be. He's removed some of the blinders from your eyes. There's a new level. There's a new wineskin. God, we ask you whatever we have to do, however we have to be undone, whatever thought processes need to be undone, whatever mindsets need to be shifted, whatever heart processes need to be moved, whatever life circumstances need to be changed in order for your Holy Spirit to have room to move, we give you permission. Come, Holy Spirit, we need thee. Come, sweet Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You've had 21 days of fasting and prayer, and as the pastor has said, there are still some that need to continue. I tell you, as you look to Jesus, as you look, confide in him as a 
a father as a son, as a brother. Let him be your all in all. I sent him to you for a reason. He is my son. I and him and him and me and you and us. I want you to walk in the spirit. Walk as he did. Love as he did. And when you do, others will see him and know him through you. Continue to look to him through the storm. Doesn't mean it will be easy through the storm, but you will have the peace, my peace, that goes beyond all understanding. <coughs> A peace that can only come through me. It's not a peace anyone can explain. <coughs> so again, the watchmen are on the wall. Pray day and night until my return. Let's say it's the Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated all across this room. Amen, Mark. I'm going to call our offering forward this morning. I have words to say in regard to that prophetic word in just a moment. But before we do that, I want to pray over our offering. Today was the miracle offering. And uh, if you did, <clears throat> if uh, you have not yet had a chance to put your miracle offering in, that's okay if you walked past the baskets this morning. Again, we're not doing it as we did in the past where we pass the baskets around. The baskets are at the tables. Um, but if you did not uh, remember uh, to bring your miracle offering today, you can certainly bring it next week or the week after that. We'll be collecting them still. Just mark it on your envelope Miracle for the miracle offering. Here's our scripture for this month for giving, James 1.17. Every good gift... And every perfect gift is from above. Somebody say amen. amen. It comes down from the Father of light with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. I want to say this to this congregation. God is our provider. God is our provider and he has good and perfect gifts to give to us as his children. Your work that's one of the ways God has chosen to provide for you, but your job is not your provider. Social security is not your provider. Medicaid, Medicare, uh, SSI, disability is not your provider. God is your provider, and every gift comes down from the Father above. Amen. We are going to be challenged in these areas in the days ahead. I want to encourage you, know that God has promised to provide for his people. He is Jehovah Jireh, the provider. Our God shall supply every need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. We are responsible to pray and to seek God's face for it. Today, we're going to pray. This, everyone in this room has a need, right? How many of you don't have a need? Is there anybody in the room who doesn't have a need? Look, we found unity. <laughs> Look at that. Here's the truth. We all have needs. The church has needs. That's what it means to be human, really, doesn't it? And this church is a group of humans. It's an organization, an organism of humans. It's a body of humans. But God is our provider. And I believe that as we bring our offerings into the storehouse, God is able to provide for our needs. There's this, there's this power, there's this supernatural release, giving, giving releases provision. So I want to thank everybody who uh, has given into this offering today. You guys are awesome. I bless you in Jesus' name. And I'm praying, as we pray this morning, we're going to pray over this offering. 
I'm going to pray that God uses it for his glory, and I'm going to pray blessing into your lives as the givers. Father, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for this wonderful congregation. I thank you for this people that you are transforming day by day, inch by inch into your glory to be conformed to the image of your son. I thank you that you've put us here with this common purpose in mind that we would reach the fullness of maturity in Christ Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for what you are doing in this place, for how your spirit is moving and for how your spirit is about to move. God, today we bring this offering and we recognize that it is us uh, practicing a spiritual discipline that will bring reward and harvest into our own lives. I pray over this offering, everybody who gave, I pray an anointing uh, on this offering. I pray your blessing on this offering. I pray that you provide for your church and all the needs of your church in this region. I pray, Lord God, that you would do this thing uh, called building your kingdom in our midst and before our eyes. I pray that as your people have been faithful to bring this offering to you, now, Lord God, I pray that you would release your power and your provision back into their lives. Reflect what they have given back into their, into their hearts, into their bank accounts, into everything that they are. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that they would understand, come to understand the supernatural power of giving, that we would all begin to grow in this thing called generosity. And as we do, we would see the power of our God reflected in generosity back to us. For all good gifts come from the Father above. All good gifts and all perfect gifts come from the Father above, the Father of lights. And we know that there is no variation or shadow due to change in you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So we've got some housekeeping items here to do before we jump into our sermon. And I I just think it's important for us to understand as a body of Christ what it is that we are doing um, as a church together. Because how many of you know this is not a social club? This This isn't a golf club, right? This isn't a tennis club. This isn't, a, this isn't even a political club. This is a, this is a gathering of the body of Christ, the sacred body of Christ uh, in Winston in Massachusetts. And we've been raised up with a purpose to uh, do life together, to reach the lost, to send the found, to discover our gifts, and to change the world. Basically, that's Matthew 28. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have a role here to do. We have one of the most important job on the face of the planet as a body of Christ. And how are we doing that? Well, we have a slide right up, up there that, that you're going to show. You might have noticed as you walked into the sanctuary today that there's been a change at our back, and that's the, the flags. The mission flags are back up. You might not know what that is, but behind me are all the flags of the countries that we support. Cornerstone supports 38 world missions in 22 countries. We are, every month we send money and we partner with 38 world missions and missionaries across the face of the globe. Those flags are representative of the countries we work with. Now, and we have 18 US missions that we are currently also supporting. So that's 23 countries all told that Cornerstone is pouring forth influence. Every month you give money towards this, we're gonna be talking about ways that you can partner with us as a church to get more involved in the work of building the gospel across the face of the planet. But you need to know that Cornerstone is already doing this work right now. We've been doing it for years, we continue to do it. But as a congregation, over the course of the next year, this is going to become more and more a part of our active outreach. In the months ahead, we're going to be talking about how you, as a regular congregant in the seat, can get more involved in personally influencing and blessing the missionaries, the 38 missionaries that are involved across the face of the planet. I look at these missionaries, the 38 missionaries across, across the globe and the 18 missionaries in our Um, in our own country. I look at these as extensions of our congregation. These are people who are part of us. We financially support them. Now, if 
as a congregant, you walked into the church, and for 20 years, you walked into your church, the church that supports you, the church that you call your home church, and nobody ever talked to you in that church, would you stay for 20 years? So if you came and you sat your butt in that pew, in that chair, and for 20 years, nobody talked to you, nobody from the congregation, oh, maybe you'd get a passing hello from the pastor every now and again. But nobody else in the congregation ever said boo to you. Would you stay in that church? These people need to hear from us. They are of us. And I'm here to say that we have not, we, our, our philosophy is doing life together. And these people are of us. And we don't even know who they are. We are going to begin to shift that. And you're going to hear ways, practical ways in the days ahead where you, about how you can begin to get more involved in these missionaries' lives. Somebody say amen. amen. How many of you are excited? It's good because we have the most important job on the face of the planet. Amen? Amen. 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 Another thing we're doing, we've got several things that we are doing in town. What you need to know is right now, two of our staff members are going every single week to the Winchin and CAC, and I think we've got other members here. Are there other members who are involved in the Winchin and CAC? I know Gail is. Anybody else who's involved? Well, we've got three people in our congregation who are going every single week to help the Winchenden Community Action Center in the town of Winchenden build, uh, do their work in our community. That's important stuff. We're actually using some of our staff time and our volunteer time as staff to go out and begin to make an impact in our town. Another way that we're doing that is we're currently partnering with Beals Memorial Library. How many of you read this book, Hey Kiddo? Look at the hands all across the congregation. If you would like to read this book, we are, the, the Beals Memorial Library is sponsored. Now, this is not a Christian book, right? This is not a Christian book. We're not reading it because it's a Christian Bible study and the whole town is joining us in a Bible study. That's not what this is. This is us stepping into our town, right? And stepping into our town and getting involved in a dialogue with them about some very important issues that are facing our town. Hey, Kiddo is a book about a young man uh, who was born to drug-addicted parents and who was raised by his grandparents, went through a cycle of abuse, and uh, learned what it meant, had to, had to live with, uh, with his grandparents all, all the time that he was growing up, and about how that affected his life. The town is actually sponsoring five different town conversations, town-wide conversations that we were at. I think there were probably 20 people at our last conversation. Nine of them were us. Amen? All right. So uh, the next one is coming up on February 11th, and uh, it's going to be a panel on trauma-informed care. And so we're getting involved in these just so that we can ask questions, so that we can learn how do we influence our town in a deeper way. If you want to go to that, um, you can see me, you can talk to Carrie Hackett, um, and, and we'll be glad to give you more information. But this is one of the things we're doing as a church to really begin to move into our town and help our town begin to grapple with some of the really hard-hitting issues. Because you know what? I believe that Jesus is the answer. How many of you believe? But we've got to walk in uh, in the right way and in an honoring way. Now listen, I've told many of you in this congregation, because this book um, is, is a triggering book. There's a lot of things. I would not recommend this for anybody who has really high triggers in the area of addiction or uh, family trauma. If you've, if, if you've walked through that, um, I would suggest take this, take, this, take this as a serious warning, a disclaimer, okay? Um, you do not have to read this book. Don't get involved in this if this is gonna trigger you but it's a powerful read for those who uh, want to get involved. It's one way that you can get involved in our community. We've just finished up, uh, let me just get to my notes here first. Um, we just finished up 21 days of fasting and prayer. And this is where I wanna talk about the prof pro prophetic word that we just heard, the watchers are on the wall. Who are the watchers on the wall? We are. You're a watcher on the wall. 
all those of us who have just uh, been through the 21 days of fasting and prayer, um, we've been watching on the wall. That's a, that's a uh, word from scripture. It's a scripturese, Christianese term. That means we've been praying. We're, we're asking God to give us vision to see what's going on in the world around us. That's all it means to be a watcher on the wall. And the word was that we were going to, uh, some of us needed to stay as watchers on the wall. We needed to be mindful of that. Here's what I want to say about that. I believe that the 21 days of fasting is the first of three, I believe. I'm certain about two. I believe there's going to be three seasons of fasting for our church this year. The next one is going to begin at Lent. God has already told me I'm going to fast uh, through the 40 days of Lent, which is coming up in March, -ish, February, -ish, February, it starts in February. So we've got just a couple weeks before we launch into that second fast. I'm not going to say this is going to be a, a church-wide thing. I encourage you, if you would like to fast along with me during that season, I invite you along on that second of this year's fast. The second one, I think, I'm not real clear on this yet, but I believe there's a third season coming up, and that will be an all-church fast. I think, everyone say, I think. I, think. I, don't, know. I don't know. But I think it's going to be in the summer. The Lord has something coming that I think we have to keep our eyes open to. I want to thank uh, John Bover and his whole team for their help. So over the course of the last 21 days, John has led 90 prayer meetings. 90. We owe him a debt of thanks because he enhanced our 21 days of fasting and prayer incredibly. Now, for those of you, uh, those of you who participated in our fasting prayer, I'd just like you to stand. If you, if you participated in any of those meetings, if you prayed even privately from home, you were online or anything, if you prayed during this season, look at, look at all the people standing. Thank you so much for your work. God is moving our church forward because of the prayers of the saints. Thank you, worship room, for all you've done. Give them a hand. So much revelation given. Amen. Amen. Now, all that's preview before the sermon even starts. So I don't know if you want to rewind that. I'm just going to go past my time today. So that's... Amen. Can always count on you, Uncle Tom. Before we move on, uh, we have a very serious prayer, uh, prayer matter to bring before the church that we want uh, to pray. Alicia Croto uh, is going for surgery tomorrow. She has a very serious surgery, and she's uh, allowed us to pray. She's, gonna, she's asked us to pray for her and to have the elders of the church come and lay hands on her, as is biblical, for the healing uh, the healing of the saints. She has to go in, and uh, there, there is a growth at the back of her brain stem, and it is grown to the place where the doctors have to take it out. It's a very serious surgery, but God has you, sister. Amen? God has you. I'm going to ask you to come forward at this time. I'm going to ask her family to join us. I'm going to ask my deacons and elders to come down and to just lay hands on Alicia. I'm going to ask... Uh, the DLT group uh, to come, the DLT, uh, the Doing Life Together group uh, that's involved in this to come. Alicia's new to the congregation. Her parents have been with us for a long, long time. Alicia's just moved to back to the area. And uh, so she goes for surgery tomorrow in Boston. I'm going to ask the rest of you to stand and extend the hand of faith. And we are believing that God is going to do a miracle here that God is going to remove this tumor with no ill effects. And we're asking for God's plan and God's purpose. Let's just begin to pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Iri ara nara basu paro nara lara basimbi iri oro kunthoro maranti iri ara nara nara nara. 
Lord, I just pray that what you have spoken to the private places of your daughter's heart, this place where she comes in faith believing that prayer is going to affect her life today. I pray whatever you have told her, prayer would do for her, that now that that would be done according to her faith in Jesus' name. We believe that our God can even now remove this tumor, that by the time she goes to the doctors tomorrow, there would be nothing there at her brain stem, that the doctors would not have to perform surgery. But we also believe that our God is a God of many pathways and directions. We pray that the pathway that you have chosen for her would be revealed to her. She would understand it. She would accept it. She would embrace it. And she would thrive in the midst of it, Lord God. We ask, Lord God, that this tumor would be removed. We ask that there would be no ill side effects, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that this, this growth would be gone in Jesus' name and the constant pain she has endured would be gone in Jesus' name. We are believing our God for it. We know he can do it. We trust you. We trust you. We trust you. We trust you, God. And now we release power into Alicia's life, into this daughter of yours' life. And we claim her blessing for the kingdom of heaven in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. And amen. Let the power of God be revealed. Let the power of God be revealed. Let the power of God be revealed. God, let it be according to her faith. Bring the healing touch. We release the healing touch. We release the glory of Jesus Christ. Power of God, power of God, power of God. Power of God, power of God, comfort of God, comfort of God, comfort of God. Oh, rest, rest in the Lord. Rest from the battle, Lord God. This long battle that she's endured, Lord God, the constant pain. Now, relief, 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 relief. We release you over her life. In Jesus' name. Hope. We speak hope. We speak joy. We speak anointing, gifts of the Holy Spirit in operation through the laying on of hands. Healing gift, healing gift, healing gift. Now released, now released in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, mighty Spirit of God. Mighty Spirit of God. Mighty Spirit of God. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Thank you, Lord. Saints, if you believe, if you pray in tongues, if you've got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to encourage you right now just to pray in tongues and pray forth healing. 
Iri araba surun kurumara narabe siri aran oraba darabara masuturun narabe yaran orodon masiti ri. Iri aran guru bara mara narabe siti iri aran naraba raba surun orobara mara narabe nasi. Iri aran orobara andoro basiri aran oro basiri ara kurun orobara andara masiri aran narada. Iri oro oro basiri aran kula rabara masutera nara. Iri aran kusuru noro bara basiri aran aran doro bala aran 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 aran. Create an atmosphere of faith in this place right now, and believe for it. Believe, believe, believe. Our God, our God is a healing God. 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 Now, 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 move in healing. Let the saints of God lift up a cry unto God today. Let the saints of God lift up a cry unto God today for a move of healing in our midst. Heal Alicia. Heal others right there, right now, right now, right now. Healing touch. Healing touch. Healing touch. Healing touch. Glory, glory, glory. Church, if you need a touch of healing today, I'm going to open these altars right now. If you need a healing from the Lord, I'm going to encourage you to come down to the altars right now. And we're going to lay hands on and heal. We're going to lay hands on for the gift of healing today. Glory, 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 glory. For these people coming forward, I'm going to ask a deacon to move right behind or a staff member to move right behind. Come on, come on, come on. Staff members, deacons, come down and begin to lay hands on. This isn't about the pastor laying hands on anybody. This is about the body. Healing is a body ministry work. Begin to lay hands on people all across, all across. Right now, healing touch, healing touch. Jerry, come on, come on and lay hands on people for healing. Lay hands on people for healing. Come on, John. Come, come, and let your prayer of faith be released for healing upon people right now. Oh, God, we're believing right now. Right now, right now, right now. We lay hands on people all across this room. We're believing for healing touches all across this room. All across this room in the mighty name of Jesus. Healing touch, healing touch in Jesus' name. Now, God, let her body be healed. Body be healed in Jesus' name. Sickness, go. Oh, difficulty, pain, go in Jesus' name. Move of healing, move of healing. We call you forth in this room. We call you forth in this room. Healing touch. Oh, church, begin to rise up, begin to rise up. Stand up on your feet and begin to call down healing in this room. Pray, most holy faith, most holy faith. Healing touch of Jesus, healing touch of Jesus now. Healing touch of Jesus now. We believe, we believe that our God is able. We believe that our God is able. We believe that our God is more than able. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Healing touch of Jesus. The deep wounds, the deep brokenness, the deep hurt. Lord God, the deep, the deep physical need now being ministered to by the balm of Gilead. Balm of Gilead, bring forth healing now in Jesus' name. Balm of Gilead, bring forth the healing touch. Lift up a praise in the house. Lift up a praise in the house because we're believing that our God is healing right now. Our God is healing right now. Our God is healing right now. Jesus, 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 you are a healer. We recognize Jehovah Rophi in this room right now. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, gift of healing. Holy Spirit, gift of healing. Holy Spirit, gift of healing right now. Holy Spirit. For her feet, Lord God, and every other physical need that she has right now, healing, healing, healing in Jesus' name. Irio rosoro katara naravasiti. Irio ramasoto naravasandaro lo rabasura kara naravasiniri. Irio ramasara naravarabasuta raneti. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, we believe deeper work, deeper work, deeper work, deeper work, deeper work, deeper work than ever before. Spirit of the Lord is here. Spirit of the Lord is walking. 
The Spirit of the Lord no ye not that no other spirit, no other spirit is here at this time. In simple faith, reach out to the Holy Spirit and receive that which you have asked. For no spirit, no power can come against your spirit. And the spirit has cleaned this place. The only other beings that are here, the angels that minister according to the power of the Lord and His Word, to reach out in faith and faith, for the Spirit is here, and He wishes to bestow upon you that which you ask for. Reach out in simple faith. Hallelujah. 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 And I believe you're my healer. I believe you are all I need. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. I believe you're. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Did you have something?
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is what it means to be Pentecostal. At the beginning of our fellowship, at the beginning of our movement, there was a rebirth of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. All throughout Christian history, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, all, it's, it's been a thread that run, has run through the entire course of Christian history. The Holy Spirit has always been active in the church, whether the church welcomed him or not. But at the beginning of the church, there was a large, a great call for the rise and power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told the disciples, in fact, do not leave Jerusalem until you've received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Do not leave Jerusalem until the baptism of the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And so they didn't. They stayed in Jerusalem, and then the baptism of the Holy Spirit came upon them on the day of Pentecost. And they began to function in supernatural power that had never been seen before. That power continued to wind like a thread, albeit sometimes very small, for the entirety of Christian history. But then in 1901, God in his sovereignty decided that it was time for a second wave of the baptism of the Holy Spirit to rise in power. And so this movement called the Assemblies of God was born. And from that, all kinds of things, has, has, the Assemblies of God as a fellowship came in 1914, all kinds of other churches, Church of God of Prophecy, Church of God, the Charismatic Renewal, all of these different moves of the Holy Spirit have been happening for the last century, 120 years. It's gone through its power phases and it's gone through its cooling phases. It's risen and it's fallen. But I'm here to say today that I believe God is about to, what we experienced here right now is just the first fruits the offering we took, the miracle offering, was a first fruits offering, whether you recognize it or not. We didn't, haven't talked much about that. And God has brought a first fruits today of the move of his Holy Spirit to the church. This is something he's been promising for a time. What does it mean to be Pentecostal? It means this, to let the power of God be released on his altar so that he can do whatever he wants to do. We're not talking about wildfire. We're talking about God's fire. I'm not talking about y'all acting crazy. I'm talking about you entering into the move of God. And wasn't that wonderful what just, what just took place? You say, oh, you know, we should keep church. You know, it should, you know you've got your agenda. You've got your, you've got your thing to finish. No. When the Holy Spirit interrupts us, we've got to take the interruption and let him do what he wants to do. Now, I'm going to give an instruction to those of you who were prayed over today. If you were here praying for healing today, I believe that God is your healer. Now, that said, I believe that her healing is a journey. Sometimes it's a quick journey. Sometimes it's one step. Sometimes it's a little bit of a walk. I don't know what God spoke to you in your heart, but be it unto you according to your faith, whatever God revealed to you today, let that be released in your life. But here's the thing. You are responsible to bring that testimony back to us. We need to hear, if you get your healing, if you get your miracle, no matter what way that comes, we need to hear about the journey of healing. Email me, email Carrie. Email Pastor Amanda. Email your DLT leader. DLT leaders, if you hear about healings, send them my way. We need to know what God is doing in our midst. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I love how the Lord orchestrates things as we go along. You just leave that music playing for the moment. It's okay. It's, I kind of like it. It's kind of nice. 
calms me down. <laughs> Lord, I just pray for the study of our word now. This is an essential part of your, of your plan today. And I pray, Lord God, that as we study together, you would open up our ears, minds, hearts, souls, and spirits to receive according to your plan and purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. All right. So now, as we move along, God has so much to give us today. And some of you have received healing today. You've re- you, some of you have been given the gift of being able to pray the gift of healing forward. Now, you notice I, I pretty much stayed up on the altar here today, and that's because healing is a body ministry. It's not meant to be a pastoral ministry. It's a body ministry. It's a ministry for elders. It's a ministry for deacons. It's a ministry for anybody who is, has the faith to believe that God is going to move. We're going to talk about healing in a couple of weeks. And I'm hoping we don't get stuck there for too long because I'm on a schedule. <laughs> and we know how my schedules usually work. They never work, but at least we have a plan. Here's the thing. I loved how that, how that played out. It's body ministry. We operate as a body, not as a minister of one and you all sit and watch. This is us together. I love that. I love that. I love that. My job is to equip the saints. My job is to mature the saints. Your job is to do the ministry, right? Don't worry, if you start getting out of order, I'm strong enough to say, cut that out. But I believe God's gonna do some amazing things in the days ahead. So here we are. This year, God has already told us so many things. You're hearing it in our music. You're hearing it prophesied and sung over us in our music. You're hearing uh, it prophesied from people operating in the gift of prophecy in our body. You're hearing it from this pulpit. It's a unified message that this year is going to be a year of storms. We certainly will face those storms. During the last 21 days, so many times, God has been talking to me about the storms that are coming. He has told us we don't need to pray the storms away. We sang about it this morning, these walls. Even in my suffering, I will sing. Even in my questioning, I believe. For you are always good. You're good to me. Raise a hallelujah in the middle of the storm. I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. Like the people in Acts 4, 29 and 30, I'm not going to ask for the storm to go away. I'm going to ask for power in the midst of the storm and power over the storm. God's not going to take the storms away. He's going to use the storms to launch miracles into our lives. Don't be afraid of the storm. Have faith in the midst of the storm. God's already told us. What you need to do is when it starts raining and winding... Winding, is that a word? <laughs> when it starts winding, you need to find God and where he's at in the storm. And what's he doing in the storm? In the middle of the storm, when things get tough, when things get hard, when you need a healing, when your life is seemingly going down the toilet. You're circling the drain. Listen, don't stop doing life together at that point. That's when you need it most. What is doing life together? It's pretty simple according to Acts 2, 42 through 47. Pray with each other. When I come in in the morning and I'm going around greeting people, if you have a prayer need, that's a perfect time to say, I need prayer. I pray for people every Sunday morning. When you're greeting each other and somebody asks how you're doing and you tell them how you're doing, listen, you other person who's just asked how a person's doing, when somebody says, I feel like I fell in the mud and a dozen horses ran over my head, 
Don't just say, God bless you and be at peace. I hope you have a great day. <laughs> you need to pray for that person. You've got the power to pray, so you don't have fancy words. Don't worry about fancy words. Just, just call Jesus in. That's what it means to pray together. We should all be praying for each other before church. Amen? We should study the word together. We should constantly be encouraging and challenging each other with the word of God. It's one of the things we're here for. We should practice hospitality. You know, you'll never find out people have a need unless you are nice to them. You know, a perfect way not to ever have to pray for a person? Don't talk to them. Don't say hello to them. That's bad. <laughs> Don't do that. Greet people. Say hello to people. Practice hospitality with each other. Have each other out for coffee. Be authentic, transparent, and vulnerable with each other. Let's be real, folks. And let's build that in our community. And begin to meet needs among each other and in our community. Let's see what God has. Listen, God has given the, the word. I gave a word last week. I'm not going to tell you what that word is because if you weren't listening, you have to go back and listen to the whole sermon all over again. <laughs> but God gave me a word that was massive. I heard it. I, I, I heard it in the 21 days of fasting and prayer. I was sitting in one of John's uh, worship sets. I think it was a four to five, if I remember correctly. And I'm sitting there in the worship set, and I'm doing what I always do during one of John's worship sets, which is sit there like a lump. <laughs> I'm not one of those people who gets up and walks around or raises my hand or shouts or sings or anything like that. I just sit there like a lump and listen to God. And in the middle of that four to five worship time, as John is singing, I don't even remember what he was singing at that point in time, he's singing some song and God says, I'm, I'm not even going to tell you what I said, what he said. You have to go back and listen to the sermon. This is what I'm going to do. And I said, oh no, not that. No, God. You know Why? Because I recognize the amount of work. I said to Sister Joan this morning, I said, get ready to come out of retirement there, sister. Because if God does what I think he's about to do, we're going to need all hands on deck. All hands on deck. The workload is going to be enormous. That's not to scare you. That's just to wake you up and say, sleep or awake. For the move of God is upon us. And that's why we're studying the word together, why we're doing life together. To encourage ourselves in this lifestyle, we're doing this study. We've started it just before Christmas. We talked about the coming of Jesus and how he came through four different types of stories. And now we're doing a larger study. And we're studying how Jesus did life with people. Because how many of you know that if Jesus did life with people in a certain way, maybe that we should follow that as a pattern. And so we've been talking for the last couple of weeks, and we're going to be talking for the next week, the next weeks all the way up till Easter, if we don't get interrupted. We're going to be talking about how Jesus did life as a human being, Jesus did life as a priest, we've already talked about those two things, how Jesus did life as a prophet. Today we're talking about how Jesus did life as a servant. We're going to talk about how he did life as a teacher, as an encourager, as a giver, as a leader, as a worker of miracles. I just want to stop there for a minute. I think that there are people in this body who don't even know this yet, but you are gifted with miracles. It's not a gift that's very common, and it usually causes more trouble than it solves. But I believe there's a miracle worker or two among us. And when you start operating in your gift, everybody better watch out. There are healers. I believe there are healers in this room. Apostles, pastors, evangelists. And finally, nobody's this, because only Jesus is this. But on Easter, we're going to talk about how he is the Messiah who releases all these gifts into our lives. We're going to go through some scripture really fast here today. And I'm going to make a couple of points. Most of this sermon is just scripture. I'm going to start in Philippians chapter 2. Verses 1 through 11, if you've got your Bibles. 
we're going to talk about Jesus, the servant. And then all this week in Digging Deeper, we're going to talk about servanthood and what it means to be a servant and the gift and the discipline of service. Our staff recently went through the discipline of service in the celebrations of discipline, and it took us like four months to get through this chapter. It's a 10-page chapter. It took us like four months. Literally, we started it in September. We just finished it to talk through what it means to be servants. But what you need to know is that Jesus began and finished his work as a servant. Everyone say servant. Philippians 2 says this, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Now that right there, those verses right there should scare you. They scare me. I mean, if we take those verses literally, why don't you just meditate on that for a minute? Just think about what Paul the Apostle is saying here. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ, Jesus. Holy mackerel, what? In my relationship with Jerry, in my relationship uh, with with Tina, in my relationship with everybody in this room, I'm supposed to take the same mind and have the same relationship and the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Well, why does that bother you so much? Listen! Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in the appearance as man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient even to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Listen, folks, we love that last verse. But there's a pattern that's being established here. If you want to be exalted in the presence of God, then you have to walk the same pathway that Jesus did, the pathway of servanthood. Everybody say amen. Amen. And if you really want to understand servanthood, then you've got to meditate on this passage of Scripture continually. You've got to look at it. Jesus began and finished his work as a servant. Secondly, Jesus taught his disciples. How many of you are disciples of Jesus in this room? I'm not talking about being one of the 12 disciples. That would be weird. But how many of you are disciples, learners of Jesus? Yeah, if anybody thinks he's Peter, come see me afterwards. I've got a deliverance for you. Okay. But Jesus taught us as disciples that we are to be servants. John chapter 13. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already uh, prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Isn't that just like Jesus? Answering a question with a, like, no answer. (laughs) You don't know what I'm doing, but you'll understand it later. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter said, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, oh, brother. (laughs) 
Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing his, their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to, the, to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? No, because you said we didn't understand it. Do you understand? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. We are called to serve one another. Serve one another. Jesus also taught a radical servanthood in leadership. Listen to this. This just like blows my mind. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may be at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, oh, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to say. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. When the ten other disciples heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. And Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to, wants to be first must be your slave. This is part of the upside-down kingdom. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus started as a servant, started and finished his work as a servant. Jesus taught his disciples to be servants. Not only that, he taught that Leadership can only be done through servanthood. If you want to lead people, you must serve them. It is not about lordship. It is about service. Somebody say amen. amen. Jesus taught that servanthood required humility. Matthew 2, uh, 23, 8 through 12. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. No, uh, nor are you to be, uh, to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Service requires us to humble ourselves. Now, Jesus also taught that there will be those who are gifted in servanthood. Paul the Apostle writes in Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Turn to the person on your right and say, I belong to you. Turn to the person on the other side and say, you belong to me. We all belong to each other. How does that feel? A yeah. little weird? It's a little strange, isn't it? This body ministry thing. Mm. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesying in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. See, right here, Jesus is saying that there are those among us. Now, we're all called to be servants. Nobody gets out of this. Just because I'm gifted as a prophet, prophet doesn't mean I get to not be a servant. We're all called to servanthood, no matter what our gift is. But Jesus says... What Paul the Apostle teaches, 
Jesus says through Paul the Apostle, there are those in the body of Christ who are particularly gifted and anointed as servants. This is their jam. It's their thing, servanthood. The servant's thought focus. Remember we talked about the prophetic thought focus last night, last week? And the idea that a, a, a person who operates from the prophetic perspective, their first question in every circumstance is, what is God doing? What's going on in the spirit realm? Their eyes are constantly casting heaven, heavenward. These are the people in our church that you say, oh, they're too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. <laughs> right? The, the, that, can be, that can be the prophet sometimes if they're immature. But the prophet's focus is always what's going on in heaven. The servant's focus is different. The first question that happens in every circumstance with a servant is, how can I help? What can I do? That's a servant's mindset. In every circumstance, no matter what is going on, the prophet's asking, oh, what's God doing? Right? Some problem in your life. What's God doing? Well, I don't know. Why is that helpful? What's God doing? That's the prophet's mindset. The servant's message is not what's God doing. The servant's mindset and focus is what can I do? How can I help? And there are those in this body Many of you who are gifted as servants. In fact, servanthood is one of the chief gifts in the body. God puts a lot of servants in the body of Christ. Why? Because their gift is absolutely essential. Absolutely essential. And there's a lot of it to, there's a lot of serving to be done. Servanthood is the gift Now, here's why. Are you ready? Servanthood is the gift that opens the door of a community. The church can never break into the community unless the servants are doing their work. The community will never open to a prophet. The community will never open to a miracle worker. The community will never open to a healer. The community will only open. That I'm talking about the people outside our four walls. My gift, it's not my gift as a prophet, it's not going to win any accolades outside these walls. The, the community will not open because of me. The community will open because of the servants. Watch this. Watch this. Acts 6, 1 through 7. In those days when the numbers of disciples were increasing, the Hellenistic Jews, the Greek Jews, Uh, the Jews from Greece, among them complained against the Hebraic Jews, the Jews from Jerusalem and Israel, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Now listen, what I'm not saying here is that every other gift is unimportant. Every gift is important for a different reason. Every gift, my gift is important to the church. Your gift, whatever it is, is important to the church. It has a role, it has a function. And uh, the apostles are saying, listen, we're recognizing this is important work, but it's not our work. We have a role in the body of Christ and it ain't that. Here's the work. It's not, we cannot leave prayer and study of the word to wait on tables. That doesn't mean nobody should wait on tables. It doesn't mean everybody should try to pray and read the word all the time. It means that there's a ministry to be done. It just wasn't the apostles' ministries. Brothers and sisters, they said, so here's what we need to do. Choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom, and we will turn the responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. And so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of, holy, of the Holy Spirit. Also, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. These are the first deacons. You know what deacon means? Servant. Deacons are servants. So the word of God spread The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased. Now watch this. This is what happened when the servant gift got activated in the body of Christ. 
If you read the previous chapters in the book of Acts, the church, after Acts chapter 5, church growth actually shut down because a prophet did his job. Prophet did his job with Ananias and Sapphira. If you don't know what Ananias, the story of Ananias and Sapphira, you look at that story, and that story explains why everyone was afraid to join the church after that. Read it. Scary. I don't know that I would have joined the church after that. But after the apostles and the prophets did their job, the, the church growth was stymied. When the servant gift got activated, watch this. So, so the word of God spread, and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests. Who was persecuting the church? The priests, the Sanhedrin. The people in, 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 the, in, the Jewish, in the Jewish faith were persecuting the church before that. Acts 4, 29 and 30, this is the answer to that prayer request. Remember, we talked about Acts 4, 29 and 30 last week, where the disciples are being persecuted by the Sanhedrin and the priests... And the disciples gather together for a quiet prayer meeting. Maybe it was loud. It caused an earthquake. But they get together for this prayer meeting. They get together for this prayer meeting. And they don't pray, protect us, save us, help us. They pray, Lord, behold their threatenings and slaughter. Hear their threats. And Lord, now give your servants boldness to proclaim the word and let healing and signs and wonders be released. Acts 4, 29 and 30. That prayer is answered in a very practical way in Acts chapter 6. Behold their threatenings and slaughter. Well, these priests were the ones threatening and slaughtering. And what did God do? He saved them. He convinced them that Jesus was the way when the servants began to do their work. If you are a servant, if your primary motivation, if your first thought in every situation is, how can I help or what can I do? What can I do to help? That makes you a servant. That's your, that's your first thought. How can I help you? Oh my gosh, that's horrible. How can I help? That's not my first thought. And this isn't good or bad, it just is. Oh my gosh, that's horrible. What is God doing? That's my first thought. You know that. Those of you who have have been with me for a while, you know that that's my first go-to. What's God doing? What's God telling you? That's just who I am. That's who God made me. But there are those in this room who their first response is, what can I do to help? That's a powerful gift in the church of Jesus Christ. In fact, it is the gift that is going to unlock our community just like it did in Acts chapter 6. When the servants start doing their thing, the power of the Holy Spirit is released. It took a prophet to pray Acts, 20, Acts 4, 29 and 30. It took a servant to be the answer to that prayer. Do you see how the body works? You can turn down the music. Jody, I'm going to have you come to the altar. If you're a servant today, I'm going to say this to you. If you think you're, you're, you're called as a servant in the body of Christ, you need to be ready in the days ahead to activate your gift in the church and in the community. Serve with abandon. Stop looking down on your gift if that's what you're doing because it's a supernatural gift of incredible power. This gift, this gift is going to unlock our community. And you need to know that your gift is valuable. Serve. If you are gifted as a servant, then serve and be prepared to serve in the days ahead. You need to know we value your gift. Your gift is so important and so powerful. 
I know that in so much of the church, you can just start playing. In so much of the church, it's the prophet this and the apostle that, the evangelist this and the pastor that. It's this teacher and that teacher, this, this psalmist, that worship leader. And the church has valued certain gifts over other gifts for a long time. It ought not to be so among us. Paul the Apostle says in 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 34, and I'm going to read this for you before we take communion. Remember, we're doing this every, every week now all the way up to Easter because this is a way that every week we rededicate ourselves to Christ and as we discover our gifts, we take those gifts and we dedicate them to the body and we allow our, our understanding of our gift to be healed and strengthened and anointed. If you're a prophet, praise God. Let your gift be healed, strengthened, and anointed. If you're a servant, as we take communion today, let your gift be healed, strengthened, and anointed. If you're not a prophet or a servant, if you're one of the other gifts, don't look down on people who have gifts that are different than yours, but embrace those gifts and, instead, and understand that we are all here for a purpose. God has called us all here. And every one of us is here for a reason. As we take communion today, we'll be mindful of that. Paul the Apostle said to the Corinthian church, in the following directions, I have directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that you come together, uh, when you come together as a church, that there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then when you come together, it's not the Lord's supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your private suppers, and as a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you uh, despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. For I received from the Lord that which I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whenever... Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone, say everyone, ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. Do you discern the body of Christ today? Not just Jesus but each other. Jesus calls us to him and to each other. And every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we're called to value each other. Value Jesus as our living head, put him in first place, and put our brothers and sisters in the place that they deserve to be, fulfilling their roles and their goals in the body of Christ. Let's take a moment and examine ourselves. If you've been guilty of elevating one of the gifts in the body above all the others, will you repent of that now? And will you recognize that in this room, underneath the anointing of Jesus Christ, we all stand on equal footing. We all have different roles. We are all important to the job ahead. Is there somebody that you look down on in the body? 
Ask God to forgive you for that right now. Do you look down on yourself? Have you said, I'm not that important in the church? Will you repent of that sin right now and recognize that you're a valuable member of this congregation? And finally, have you been holding out on God? Is there any area of your life which is not in Jesus' control? Give him control today. Jesus, you hear our silent prayers today all across this room. Prayers of repentance. Prayers asking for forgiveness. For not letting you have full control of our lives. For looking down on ourselves or others. Now, Lord Jesus, as we take this bread together, we recognize that your body was broken for us for the forgiveness of our sins. And we ask you humbly to forgive us all our sins. Sins of omission, commission, and even the sins of our thoughts. In Jesus' name, we receive this forgiveness now. Let's partake together. After supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. The only reason that any of us is going to heaven is because Jesus died on the cross for us. There isn't any one of us who's worthy in our own work. There isn't any one of us in, who will become worthy in our own work. Jesus is the author, the continuer, and the finisher of our faith. It's all him. Our job is to believe, to agree with the agreement he made with us. Jesus, today, by taking this cup, we say, Lord, we agree with you. We agree that your death on the cross is enough. We enter into covenant with you, and we rededicate ourselves to following you letting you be God in our lives. Let's partake together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this time we've shared together as brothers and sisters. I pray, Lord God, for those who are struggling in their faith, who are trying to walk their faith out. I pray, Lord Jesus, that they would realize that this is about a personal relationship about religion, but it's about connecting with you. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would all begin to grow in our connection with you, that we would be able to grow in our connection with each other. Lord, bless our time as we go from this place. Strengthen us. Build us up. Holy Spirit, you do your work in our hearts, for that is what we need most of all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Be at peace. And remember, your mission field is out there. You're walking into it right now. So bring your blessing and your peace to that place. Amen? I'll catch you later.